Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's Magic by Betty McDonald. Chapter 4. The Bad Table Manners Cure. <laughs> Christopher Brown was through with his milk. His mother was in the pantry polishing silver, but she didn't have to go into the kitchen to see that Christopher was through eating. She could tell because the noises had stopped. Mrs. Brown was terribly ashamed of Christopher's table manners, and she talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked, but so far it hadn't done a speck of good. Christopher was ten years old and a very nice little boy in other ways. He had red hair. He was a fine baseball player. He was a good sport. He got excellent grades in school, and he kept his room reasonably neat, but he certainly had horrible table manners. No, that isn't right. He really had no table manners at all. He ate just like an animal, a starving, wild animal. Mr. and Mrs. Brown had gradually become used to Christopher's table manners. Of course they made him eat in the kitchen, but what worried Mrs. Brown so terribly was that someday one of Christopher's friends would invite him to dinner, not just a children's party, Chris had been to a lot of those, and he was so much fun and so good at the games that the children didn't really care if he ate like a starving animal. No, Mrs. Brown was afraid he'd be asked to stay all night or to visit in another town or to go to the country with some of his friends' families. How dreadful it would be when Christopher took his first bite and began to chew. Christopher chewed with his mouth open so that you could see all the food as he rinsed it around in his mouth. Also, he smacked his lips so loud it sounded like someone slapping their hands on water. He gulped when he swallowed. He washed food down with milk. He made enormous piles of meat, potatoes, peas, carrots, and gravy on his fork and then thrust the fork so far down his throat you could hardly see the handle. He used his thumb to assemble big fork loads. He propped his knife and fork against his plate with the handles on the table. He buttered whole slices of bread on his hand. He chopped and smashed and mixed his food until his dinner looked like dog food. He picked up his soup bowl and held it just under his chin while he slurped his soup. He talked while he was chewing. He gestured with a fork full of food so that bits of food shot around the room like stones from a slingshot. I could go on indefinitely about Christopher's table manners, but I think I've told you enough to show you that having Christopher sitting beside you at the table was almost exactly like eating next to a wolf. Watching him eat was certainly not a sight to whet the appetite. Mrs. Brown rubbed polish on the silver and thought about Christopher's table manners and was sad. There should be a school for table manners, she said to herself, and attendance should be compulsory. The telephone rang. It was Mrs. Thompson, Dick's mother. She said, I'm having a few of Dick's friends over for dinner a week from Saturday. My brother Charles, the big game hunter, is going to visit us for a few days, and I thought it would be so nice if some of Dick's friends could meet Charles and see his movies of hunting lions and tigers in Africa. I'm just asking Christopher, Hubert Prentice, and Larry Gray, because there will be twelve grown-ups, too. Mrs. Brown thanked Mrs. Thompson said that she knew Christopher would be delighted, and then went out and made herself a big pot of black coffee. Her hands shook when she poured the first cup. Twelve grown-ups, and Mrs. Thompson's famous brother Charles, all sitting at the table with Christopher. Mrs. Brown couldn't bear even to think about it. Oh, what will I do? What will I do? She said. She would give Christoph a good talking to, and he would be very nice and pleasant and agree to everything she said and really try to have better manners for a meal or two. And then back he'd go to... <coughs> crunch, choke, gurgle, gulp. And Mrs. Brown shuddered. She called her friend Mrs. Penzel. She said, Mrs. Penzel, I'm not going to beat around the bush. My son, Christopher, has the worst table manners in the whole world, and I don't know how to cure them. Do Percy, Pamela, and Potter have nice table manners? 
And Mrs. Penzel said, well, I, I never noticed, Mrs. Brown. You see, Percy and Pamela and Potter have always been allowed to make their own decisions about everything. And as soon as they were born, we gave them free reign. And actually, I haven't really seen them eat for several years. What do they live on? Mrs. Brown asked. Oh, they eat, said Mrs. Penzel, but only when the need for food occurs to them. Now Potter eats nothing but peanut butter and poppy seeds, and he always eats at night. And he says that eating during the day is much too common a practice and should be stopped. Pamela eats nothing but weenies and bananas. She does her own shopping and peels the bananas herself, which I think is very progressive for a child of seven years. I don't said Mrs. Brown crossly. I think it's dreadful to let a child live on weenies and bananas. What does Percy eat? Percy? Now let me see, said Mrs. Pencil. Oh, yes, Percy. Well, Percy eats anything. He's most cooperative. Just give him cookies, candy, marshmallows, cake, ice cream, and root beer, and you don't have to worry about Percy. He's a fine boy. Mrs. Brown said, Well, Mrs. Pencil... I guess everyone has their problems. You've cheered me up a lot, and I do hope you know a good doctor. You're going to need one. And Mrs. Pencil said, Oh, I think not. Both Mr. Pencil and I were brought up the same way, and we're both terribly happy. Mr. Pencil never eats anything but capered salmon and grape nuts, and I never eat. And Mrs. Brown hung up the phone. Kippered salmon and grape nuts. Ugh. She called Mrs. Pigglewiggle and told her the whole problem. She didn't leave out a thing when she described the way Christopher ate, and when she told about the dinner party he'd been invited to and how ashamed she was going to be, she got tears in her eyes. And Mrs. Pigglewiggle said, Now, Mrs. Brown, don't worry so. Christopher is such a darling boy, and I know how to cure him. It's going to take cooperation on your part, and it may be a little inconvenient, but I have the cure. I'm going to lend you Lester. Lester, said Mrs. Brown. Who is he? He is a pig, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle. Oh, oh no, said Mrs. Brown. Not a pig. I have no <coughs> place to keep a pig. And this is a restricted neighborhood. <coughs> oh, and she coughed in dismay. <coughs> no. Just a minute, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle. Buster's absolutely no trouble. He has beautiful manners, is very quiet, and sleeps in the basement. So nobody in the neighborhood need know about him. But where shall I put his trow? said Mrs. Brown. Oh, Lester doesn't use a trowel, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle. That's the whole point. Lester has the most beautiful table manners you have ever seen, and I want him to eat at the kitchen table with Christopher. He'll be very surprised. Lester will teach Christopher how to eat. But it sounds fantastic, said Mrs. Brown. I know, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle. Every mother I send Lester to has the same feeling. But let me tell you that once you've had Lester in your house, you won't want to let him come home to me. I always have that trouble. Everybody loves Lester and wants to keep him. Oh, and by the way, he likes to sleep on a clean blanket on the basement floor. Also, he likes to have the basement door left open so he can go out for his exercise after dark and when the neighbors are asleep. Have Christopher stop by after school and I'll send Lester over. Mrs. Martin just returned him this morning. But what does he eat? said Mrs. Brown. Exactly what Christopher does, except much larger portions. And oh yes, I almost forgot, Lester is very fond of coffee. He takes cream and sugar, and he often drinks as many as five cups at a meal. Now don't worry, Mrs. Brown. Fix Lester a nice bed on a clean blanket by the furnace, and I'm sure he'll solve all your problems. Goodbye. And Mrs. Brown went up and got a clean blue blanket out of the guest room closet, and with many misgivings unfolded it and put it on the floor besides the furnace in the basement. She looked at the clock. She had ten minutes before she could expect Christopher. She made some cocoa with whipped cream, fixed two plates of ginger cookies, one much larger than the other, and polished two large red apples. She got out spoons and napkins, and then remembering what Mrs. Pigglewiggle had said about Lester's manners, she took two of her good linen doilies and put them on the kitchen table. At exactly 
there was a knock at the back door, and there stood Christopher, who usually never knocked, and a large white pig. Christopher said, Mother, this is Lester, and we got to keep him. He's so much fun. He's so smart. He knows everything, don't you, old boy? And Mrs. Brown said, Come in, Christopher and Lester. I have some cocoa for you. And Christopher said, Oh, boy! And he dashed over to the table and began gulping his cocoa. Lester walked daintily into the kitchen, closed the door carefully behind him, climbed up and sat down across the table from Christopher. Christopher was jamming his mouth full of cookies and washing it down with cocoa. Lester looked at him, then took one cookie carefully between the split in his front hoof and ate it very slowly and with tiny bites. He picked his cocoa cup up with his hoof and after one small sip, put it carefully down while he patted his snout with his napkin. Christopher stopped eating, or at least stopped chewing, to watch Lester eat. Christopher's mouth was open but full. He had whipped cream on his upper lip and crumbs on his chin. Lester reached across the table and gently closed Christopher's mouth. Then he wiped the whipped cream off his upper lip and the crumbs off his chin. Christopher was delighted. He said with his mouth full, Gosh, you're smart, Lester. And Lester put his hoof across his lips and pointed to Christopher's full cheeks to indicate no talking with a full mouth. And Christopher looked up at his mother. Isn't he smart, mother? Isn't Lester wonderful? And Lester looked over at Mrs. Brown, and she was sure he winked at her. It usually took Christopher about three and a quarter minutes to gag down his cookies and cocoa. This day, either because of the excitement of having Lester with him, or perhaps because of the good example set by Lester, Christopher was still eating at four o'clock. Mrs. Brown came downstairs to clear up the cocoa things, and was most surprised to find that Christopher had only just finished, and Lester was but halfway through. Mrs. Brown asked Lester if he'd care for some more cocoa, and he nodded his head and handed her his cocoa cup. Christopher said that he didn't care for any more and began eating his apple. Crunchy, smashing gulp. Lester reached across the table and took the apple away from him, got down off his chair, went over to a drawer in the kitchen, took a knife and cut Christopher's apple into small sections, cored each section, put them on the empty cookie plate, and handed the plate to Christopher. Christopher put a whole section of apple in his mouth. Lester shook his head at him, reached over and took one of the sections and took one very small bite. Chris gulped down the first section and took another, but this time, instead of stuffing it all in his mouth, he took one small bite. Lester looked approvingly at him. At 4.30, both Lester and Christopher had finished their cocoa and apples, and Christopher took Lester down to the basement to show him his bed. Lester looked carefully around the furnace room, straightened out several wrinkles in the blue guest room blanket, then nodded at Christopher to show him the bed was all right. They went into the game room. There was a red tennis ball on the floor. Lester picked it up and threw it at Chris. Chris caught it and threw it back. Lester caught it neatly in his mouth, then took it out with his hooves and threw it at Chris. They played ball until it was time for the mystery cowboy radio programs that Christopher listened to every evening. He said to Lester, Gee, Lester, I hope you don't mind, but I always listen to a bunch of keen radio programs at five o'clock. I mean, of course, if you'd rather play ball, I don't have to. And Lester shook his head, turned, and pointed to the fireplace where a nice little fire was laid. And Christopher said, Do you want me to light the fire, Lester? Do you? And Lester nodded. So Christopher struck a match and lit the paper. Lester stretched out on the hearth rug and closed his eyes. Christopher crouched by the radio and listened to his programs. It was very peaceful. When Mr. Brown came home from work, Mrs. Brown told him about the invitation to dinner to meet Mrs. Thompson's famous brother, Charles, about Mrs. Piggle-Wiggle and about Lester. Mr. Brown was most skeptical about Lester being able to teach Christopher table manners. Talk about the blind bleeding the blind, he said, and laughed out loud. And Mrs. Brown said, hush, Philip. Lester's right down in the basement and really is the most beautiful table manners I've ever seen.
And Mr. Brown said, guess I'll go down and have a look at Lester. And he went down the basement stairs whistling, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? And Mrs. Brown ground. Mr. Brown looked first in the wood room, no Lester. Then he looked in the furnace room. He saw the blue guest room blanket lying on the floor, so he picked it up, shook it, took it into the laundry, and stuffed it in the laundry chute. He went around the laundry, peering under the washing machine, laundry tubs, and ironing boards. He got no response. He noticed that the basement door was open a little, so he closed and locked it, muttering about burglars and carelessness. Then hearing the radio from the game room, he decided to go in and ask Christopher where he kept his pig. He was certainly surprised to see Lester lying on the hearth rug in front of a crackling fire, apparently listening to the radio. Lester opened his eyes and gave him a cold look. Then seeing that it was Mr. Brown, he jumped to his feet and held out his hoof. "'I'll be darned!' said Mr. Brown, shaking hands and beaming. Christopher said, "'Boy, isn't Lester smart, Daddy, isn't he?' <coughs> and Mr. Brown said, "'Pigs are the smartest animals there are.'" Mr. Brown bent over and began scratching Lester behind the ears. Lester gently but firmly pushed his hand away, then went over and lay down again by the fire. And Mr. Brown, slightly red in the face, said, "'Well, I guess I'd better see how dinner's coming along.'" Christopher said, "'Just a minute, Daddy. I want to show you how keen Lester plays ball. Come on, Lester, old boy, let's play a game.'" And he picked up the red tennis ball, and Lester rather unwillingly got to his feet. Christopher threw him the ball, and he caught it in his mouth and threw it back. Christopher threw it again, and Lester caught it, but this time Lester threw it to Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown was so surprised he almost missed, but you could tell he was pleased because he kept looking at Lester and smiling. They played three-cornered catch until Mrs. Brown called to say dinner was ready and to tell Christopher to wash his hands. There was a small laboratory off the game room, and Christopher rushed in and, in his usual way, wet his hands, splashed a little water on his face, and was going to wipe all the dirt off on the towel when Lester, who had followed him in, took the towel away from him and put it back on the towel rack, put the stopper in the basin, filled it to the brim with hot water, and began washing his own face and hoofs thoroughly and with lots of soap. When he'd finished, he let the water out of the bas basin and filled it up with fresh hot water for Christopher. While Christopher watched, Lester dried his nice clean face and hooves, and then Christopher washed thoroughly and with lots of soap. While he dried his face and hands, Lester took the hairbrush and dampened and smoothed the bristles on his neck and around his ears. Christopher watched him, then dampened and brushed his hair, too. Then they went up to dinner. Unfortunately, Mrs. Brown, forgetting about Lester, had spare ribs for dinner. They were crisp and brown, and Mr. Brown gave Lester an extra-large helping. Lester sat down at the table, smiled because everything looked and smelled so delicious, unfolded his napkin, took a sip of milk, then cut off a small piece of the spare rib. He put it in his mouth, began to chew, then turned terribly pale and pushed his plate away. Christopher washed him anxiously. Gosh, Lester, what's the matter? Don't you like spare ribs? And Lester took his spare ribs and put them on Christopher's plate. Christopher said, Lester, I'll go tell Mother you don't like spare ribs. She'll fry you some eggs or something. That's what she does for Daddy when he doesn't like something. And he started to get down from his chair. Lester reached over and took hold of his shoulder. He shook his head sternly, pointed to Christopher's dinner, and by chewing motions indicated that Christopher was to continue with his dinner. Lester had two helpings of dressing, sweet potatoes, and string beans. He also ate his salad, two dishes of peaches, two pieces of applesauce cake, and drank four cups of coffee. Christopher ate all his dinner and with much less noise than usual. He even asked Lester if it was all right to pick his spare rib bones up in his fingers. After dinner, he and Christopher and Mr. Brown played ball for a while. Then it was time for Chris to go to bed. He and Mr. Brown said goodnight to Lester and went upstairs. Lester went into his bed, but it wasn't there. He looked all over the basement, thinking perhaps Mrs. Brown had moved it. He couldn't find it anywhere. 
Then he checked to see if the back door had been left open and found it shut and locked. He looked again to see if he could find the blanket. It just wasn't anywhere, so he decided to go upstairs and ask Mrs. Brown where it was. He went up the basement stairs, had quite a time with the basement door, which stuck, trotted through the kitchen and dining room, and then stood politely at the living room door. Mr. and Mrs. Brown were playing cribbage and arguing, so they didn't see Lester for a few minutes. When Mrs. Brown happened to look up, she said, "'Why, Lester, have you come to visit us?' Lester shook his head. Mr. Brown said, "'What's the matter, then? Is it cold down in the basement?' Lester shook his head. "'Oh, I know,' Mr. Brown said. "'You want me to play ball with you, don't you, old boy?' Lester shook his head. Then deciding that would be a very good way to get them down to the basement, he nodded his head vigorously several times. Mr. Brown beamed. "'Okay, old boy,' he said. "'Come on down, Alice, and watch.' Mrs. Brown said she'd like to, so they went downstairs. But Lester, in spite of his flawless manners, went first, and instead of going into the game room, stood by the furnace room door. Mrs. Brown looked in the furnace room. "'But where is your blanket?' she said. Lester shook his head. Mrs. Brown said, "'Why, that's the funniest thing. I put the blue guest room blanket on the floor here this afternoon. I wonder what could have happened to it.' And Mr. Brown, looking very embarrassed, went and got it out of the laundry chute. He said, I didn't know it was Lester's bed. I just thought it had fallen on the floor. Mrs. Brown spread it out on the floor, and Lester carefully smoothed out the wrinkles and turned one corner over like a little pillow. Mr. and Mrs. Brown watched him in amazement. I've never in my life seen such a smart animal, said Mrs. Brown. He seems almost human. Lester looked up at her quizzically. Now you're all ready to go to bed, so I guess we'll go upstairs, said Mr. and Mrs. Brown. They started toward the stairway, but Lester took his hooves and gently pushed them toward the basement door. Now what's the matter, old boy, said Mr. Brown. The basement door is locked and there's not a thing to worry about. And Mrs. Brown said, well, of course, that's the trouble. Mrs. Piggawiggle told me to be sure and leave the basement door open a crack so Lester can go out in the night and get his exercise. She unlatched the door and opened it one inch. Lester nodded approval, waited politely while they preceded him through the doorway, and started up the stairs. Then he went in, lay down on the blue blanket, and went to sleep. The next morning, when Christopher came downstairs and found his mother frying bacon, he was shocked. He said, my gosh, mother, don't you have any heart at all? Last night you had spare ribs for dinner, and Lester almost got sick, and now this morning you're cooking bacon. Mrs. Brown said, why, Chris, I thought I had a delicious dinner last night. Spare ribs have always been one of your favorite foods. Chris said, but mother, spare ribs are pork. They come from dead pigs. Mrs. Brown clapped her hand over her mouth. She said, oh, Chris, I didn't even think about that. I'm terribly sorry. Do you suppose Lester noticed? Chris said, I should say he did notice. He took one bite and then turned pale and pushed his plate away. I was going to tell you, but he wouldn't let me. Mrs. Brown said, okay, come hurry before he comes upstairs. Take this bacon into your father. I'll give you and Lester cereal and scrambled eggs and toast for breakfast. Hurry now. Take the bacon to dad and I'll air out the kitchen. And she opened the back door and shooed the bacon smoke out with her apron so that when Lester came upstairs a few minutes later, the kitchen smelled only of oatmeal and buttered toast. As a usual thing at breakfast, Chris dumped a pitcher of cream on his mush, put on four heaping spoons of sugar, then stirred and stirred as though he were mixing cement. When the mush was exactly the right consistency and the correct degree of coolness, he would lift the bowl up to just below his chin and shovel in the mush as fast as he could swallow. This morning, forgetting about Lester, he began his usual gluttonous proceedings and dumped the entire pitcher of cream on his mush and was just reaching for the sugar when he looked up and saw Lester looking sadly into the empty cream pitcher. Instantly, he was sorry. Aw, oh, gee, Lester, I didn't mean to be such a pig. I mean, I mean, I mean, such a glutton. Lester just looked at him. Chris said, I'll get some more cream. Hold on a minute. Lester shook his head. He reached over and picked up Chris's bowl of oatmeal and then carefully poured half the cream 
on his own cereal. And Chris said, That's right, we'll each have half. Would you like some sugar? Lester nodded and helped himself carefully to two levels, spoons of sugar. Chris, who'd watched him, did the same. When Chris started his cement mixer stirring, Lester reached over and took his spoon away and showed Chris how cereal should be eaten. A spoonful at a time, lifted slowly and daintily from the bowl so that each spoonful contained hot cereal, cold cream, and sweet sugar. Chris tried it. He said, Say, Lester, this tastes much better than the old way. And Lester nodded and smiled. When Chris began to scrape his dish, Lester shook his head and pointed to his spoon, placed on the plate beside his almost empty dish. When Chris was eating his scrambled eggs, Lester reached over and closed his mouth three times. He showed him that he must break his toast into small pieces and that he must not hold the toast in the palm of his hand when putting on jam. He made him put down his milk glass and wipe the milk mustache from his upper lip between sips. Chris obviously didn't mind these criticisms because he hugged Lester goodbye when he left for school and promised to run all the way home for lunch. It was a beautiful morning, and Mrs. Brown did a large washing. When she went to hang it on the line, Lester helped her carry the clothes basket of wet clothes from the basement, handed her clothespins as she needed them, and then when the washing was all up, he lay down on the grass in the sun, well hidden from the neighbors by two sheets and a tablecloth. Mrs. Brown knelt down and timidly stroked his back, she said, thanks so much for helping with the clothes, Lester, and thank you so much for helping me with Chris's manners. I can see a great improvement already. Lester grunted a little. <sniffs> By the night of Dick Thompson's dinner party, Chris's table manners were absolutely perfect, and the Brown family all loved Lester so much they couldn't even think about his ever leaving. Lester came upstairs with Chris while he bathed and got dressed. He washed Christopher's back and made him wash his ears twice. He made him polish his shoes, and he sent him back to his room for a clean handkerchief. After Chris had gone, Lester went out to the kitchen to wait for dinner. Noticing immediately that there was no place set for him on the kitchen table, and feeling lonely for Chris and quite sad, he started down to the basement to lie in his blanket. Mrs. Brown called to him. She said, Lester, I thought that as long as Chris wasn't here, you would like to eat in the dining room with Mr. Brown and me. And Lester nodded his head vigorously and trotted happily after her into the dining room. They had roast of lamb for dinner, and though Lester ate three large helpings, his table manners were so beautiful that Mr. and Mrs. Brown just stared at him in admiration. After dinner, Mr. Brown and Lester played catch while Mrs. Brown washed the dishes. Then they all sat in the living room and listened to the radio and waited for Christopher. He came home at 10 o'clock, bursting with excitement and filled with tales of Africa and lions. Everyone listened to his stories, heard what the Thompsons had to eat and what Uncle Charlie looked like, and then went to bed. The next morning, Mrs. Brown had two telephone calls. The first one made her very proud. It was from Mrs. Thompson, and she said that she just had to call Mrs. Brown and tell her that in all her life she had never seen such a beautifully behaved boy as Christopher. His table manners are simply perfect, she said, and Mrs. Brown smiled and smiled. His second telephone call was from Mrs. Piggle Wiggle, and it made Mrs. Brown very sad. Mrs. Pigglewiggle asked Mrs. Brown how she liked Lester, and Mrs. Brown said, Oh, Mrs. Pigglewiggle, he has such perfectly beautiful manners. He's such a wonderful teacher, and he's so charming that I feel just like crying when I think of all the times I've said that people are pigs or ate like pigs or were selfish like pigs. And Mrs. Pigglewiggle said, Well, of course, dear. He certainly is a dear Lester, and I hate to take him away from you so soon. But I've just had an emergency call from Mrs. Burbank. Tell Christopher to bring Lester over on his way back to school this noon. And when Mrs. Brown said goodbye to Lester, she had tears in her eyes. And she thought he seemed a little sad at leaving, too. End of chapter four, The Bad Table Manners Cure.